good afternoon everybody and warm dia to all the brazilian vet friends out here a warm welcome to everyone as we are about to begin a webinar on avian surgery by our adjunct speaker dr plinio antovani it is a delight to have you all with us on this platform thank you all for joining us and special thanks to our speaker dr plinio from brazil it is my privilege to introduce you an exemplary wildlife vet who is also a very close friend of mine a today speaker dr plinio mantovani dr plinio did his graduation in veterinary medicine in 2007 from minas gerais federal university brazil and masters in 2010 from the same university with special emphasis in veterinary clinical clinics and surgery and his research line was in orthopedics and traumatology he has worked with wildlife rescue rehabilitation and conservation projects for 9 years with peserins and cetacins including different species of macaws especially the lir macaw he has participated in karuna abhiyan at jivdaya charitable trust during uttrayan the kite flying festival in 2017 18 and 2020 at Ahmedabad Gujarat currently he is working as a wild animal surgeon a private practicing wildlife wild animal surgeon in two states sao paulo and minas gerais in brazil and further he also coordinates the lir macaw rescue program radiological units lasers microsurgery techniques extremely safe anesthesia surgical magnification yes avian surgery has come a long way in early 90s the main surgical procedures were often discussed as a last ditch procedure for pets or wild birds which are destined to release just about the only commonly performed avian surgery 20 years ago was the surgical sexing many pet owners and breeders relied on this procedure to accurately identify the sex of the birds since those early days of avian surgeries there have been many wonderful advances that make the procedures extremely safe and precise improving the quality life of many avian patients as avian medicine advances we will be better able to care for pets and aviary birds while many avian vets in practice are developing new and better ways to perform surgery so in light of this same i request dr plinio to enlighten us with current and cutting edge reference in providing clear information pertinent to surgical care of avian species over to you dr plinio hello good afternoon everybody can you hear me Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Diviash, for this brief introduction. I feel very honored speaking to you today, and hopefully, I'm speaking to a lot of Indian friends also. Um, I'm here to speak about um, avian surgery with a focus on soft tissue. especially instruments and techniques and I, th i felt very honored with this invitation and i hopefully um, think you enjoy this presentation and as you may already realized english is not my mother language i speak portuguese but i know that the accent is not an issue for you indians I've been to India for three times and I've been to five different regions over there. So despite this language barrier, uh, I feel that we have um, many similar challenges as we uh, practice surgery. So hopefully this presentation will give you lots of tips to start doing avian surgery or to improve your your results. Um 
This is a brief program of what I'm going to speak today. I'm going to give a quickly introduction on avian medicine and I'll speak with, uh, we we'll speak um, we need to share your of equipment and instruments, uh, most that we most use for supportive care, the pre and post and post operative time. Uh, we will speak of special instruments for tissue manipulations and hemostasis. And uh, I'll, during the presentations, show some pictures of Sir, the uh, your presentation is not visible. You kindly share the presentation. Oh, not visible. Sorry. What about now? I need to go full screen. It's fine, yeah. sir. It's fine. good. Okay. So now we are going. And I'll, I'll leave all my contact information on the last slide also. So if you did not catch it, don't. That's not a problem. I'll show you later. And our program. So I will speak with you about uh, all these equipments, all while showing some techniques. Um, I choose um, the most common techniques that we perform in, in avian medicines. Uh, it's mass removal, removals like uh, feather cysts, neoplasias, um, abscesses. Uh, removal of foreign bodies, like binding, and also we speak a little bit of propatagial suture, something that I learned a lot with all my Indian friends. Um, when I speak of avian medicine, it's uh, very difficult to do or speak of all these species in one presentation. It would be like talking... Just uh, a moment. You, okay. Can you can you please minimize that small window? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right now. Thank you. Uh, it was like I was talking uh, about cats and whales, and at the same presentation, we have uh, more than ten thousand species of birds, so it would be impossible to know all of them. So uh, we should work for this, this is species specific knowledge in, in medicine and of course in surgery, uh, but we, it's not practical to do this. So when we treat um, birds, we should at least know them and the taxonomic level of order. Uh, at the level of order, we we'll have many similarities in these species. Um, most of them will have the same uh, feeding needs, will have the same handling needs and the same equipments and they will share basically the same uh, problems. I've gathered here a few groups of birds that uh, we should know of them. Uh, most commonly pet birds that we have would be like the cockatiel, Amazon pirates, the lorries, and cockatoos. These are very good pets and, and they have um, quite high uh, market price. So people who usually have them um, treat them very well and will pay for diagnosis, we'll pay for surgery. So we have a um, very good routine around in, in pet birds. Uh, we have um, passerine birds that are quite of a challenge because they are really, really small. We're talking about a 20 grams animal um, who also has um, very high pr uh, market price. You no, know, these birds, these uh, singing birds, they could cost up to $5,000 and 
We'll have some uh, exotic animals from all around the world, uh, you know, turacos and the crowned crane from Africa. Um, uh, we usually uh, have them in hotels and hostels, um, pet farms, uh, zoos, and uh, these kind of facilities, they usually treat the birds very well and will will demand uh, treatment. We'll have uh, wild animals that are um, always a challenge for everybody uh, because the animal is very stressful and there's always an issue of who is paying the bill. Is it the government? Is, this, is it NGOs? The people who rescue them and so uh, everywhere there's um, legal and financial issues uh, when you have to work with these uh, uh, wild animals. Uh, we have uh, raptor birds. Uh, it's not very common here in, in Brazil you know, falconry, but in Middle East is very popular and they are very advanced in the knowledge and care of these birds. We have uh, a lot of um, literature on these birds and people who own them, who do practice the falconry, they are usually very attends to the bird, they, they really know the bird very well. They, they, they come complaining of um, um, little small things they can uh, capture little details that the bird is presenting. So they are <clears throat> very, um, very difficult birds to care because uh, people expect uh, the best results on them. And we have some species that are really uh, high demanding, like the um, uh, peregrine falcon, but we also have some species that are uh, more common and they are really adapted to the um, urban, uh, urban life, like the black kites that you have in India, we have some similar species around here, like the karakara. And the black kite is a very common bird. I think you have them all over India. And it's certainly a bird that uh, any vet that would um, offer uh, service to avian patients will have the challenge to treat this kind of species. But it's a very good bird to start uh, uh, treating because they are actually large for a bird. So you can uh, afford to lose some blood. You have large tissues to manipulate. Um, it's a very adapted bird. It, it uh, adapt uh, easy to the captivity and uh, it's almost everything, so it's a good bird to start um, treating. Uh, there are a few considerations that uh, all the bird species share that we should know, and we can we can um, think of them every time we we treat a bird. Uh, as we think of their no normal physiology, they have a really adapted cardiorespiratory system, a very efficient uh, res cardiorespiratory system um, with a high metabolic rate and high body temperature. So every bird that we exam, we should always take care of their temperature, of their glucose levels and their oxygenation. Uh, if we optimize these three things, we can um, stabilize most of the birds. Uh, we have to remember that every time we handle a bird, this uh, is a stressful situation for it. Uh, birds are usually prey. Even 
predator birds, um, when they are caught, when they are, uh, they have physical physical restraint, uh, they react with a um, stress response. So we should optimize every ha uh, handling handling of this bird. Uh, we should take this in mind that it is stress, uh, it is with pain. Uh, birds don't deal well with hemorrhage. We have to stop the bleeding as quick as you can. And I always assume that uh, there is some kind of dehydration uh, with the bird. A bird that can fly, a bird that is not alert, uh, do not eat well, and uh, consequently the, is do not um, drink well, so I always assume that some kind of dehydration. Um, as physical restraint is very stressful for birds, we um, usually uh, do uh, whole body examinations, we take biological samples, we do uh, complementary diagnosis with the bird, uh, under general anesthesia. The most common or the most easiest uh, anesthesia that we use is the um, uh, inhalation anesthesia uh, because the birds um, go into sedated and anesthetic plants very quickly and returns for meat very quickly. So every time I plan to handle a bird for more than five minutes. I usually consider uh, do it under gas anesthesia, but uh, we have to take in mind that we are sometimes uh, anesthetizing a bird to get blood samples to do uh, anesthesia risk, risk, you know. So you have to do it very carefully with all the emergency equipments around us. Um, so we can act as soon as we see some of these problems and we have to avoid hypotensive drugs. Uh, I, I do not like um, to sedate birds except when I'm expecting a long surgical time, uh, for example, in orthopedic surgery, uh, because uh, if, if, I, if the bird is sedated, it loses its balance and it it, get, it gets more agitated actually so uh, it can fall from the perch it can um, put its wing uh, between uh, the bars of the cages and we could have um, a complication uh, with this with this bird trying to get into the normal position so uh, I usually avoid this type of, of of drugs. As I said, every 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 time I, I try to examine the birds, I try to treat them as an emergency because of the, their high metabolic rate. So I try to use this ABC life protocol that is uh, adapted from domestic animals. Uh, we apply the A, B, C, D, E um, protocol that, that I check for airway, breathing, circulation, disability. Disability is like my neurological exam. And if the bird is anything less than alert, I don't consider it stable. And I will consider giving him oxygenation, uh, intubation, intermit intermittent positive pressure ventilation, you know, manual ventilation, uh, to get it stable so I can go to uh, my second care and my second diagnosis, the main diagnosis, only after the bird is stable. Uh, there's a high risk of death if I put a um, uh, shocking bird uh, at physical restraint on a table for an x-ray, for example. So I have to take this in mind and always make sure that the bird is stable 
uh, while doing um, long, long handlings. Uh, one thing that we can do to um, promote support to stabilize the bird uh, for uh, the pre-op period or even after surgery is to put it in a controlled environment. We have this equipment that we call the avian treatment unit. Uh, we have them in many, many brands. These are the most um, popular brands. Um, around the world, but every country certainly has um, um, affordable brand. And with this unit, we can control temperature that should be high. 29 um, degrees Celsius is very high. If you put a mammal in this temperature, it will fry the, the, the mammal, uh, but birds can handle even higher temperatures. You know, chicks can handle or will even need temperatures of 31 or 32 degrees Celsius. We can control humidity around 70% and we can enhance the oxygen supply, putting a source of oxygen inside this box. We should make, make sure that we control all sound, sound and light so we should not do, uh, we should low our voices, we should not put this bird right beside a dog, a barking dog, and not in the front of a cat, because it will feel as if the cat is about to hunt it. And we should provide feeding support, uh, even in the pre-op or in the post-op period. Uh, we do not worry uh, of fasting the bird uh, as we worry of fasting dogs and cats before surgery because we um, must think of the glucose levels during surgery. So the fasting period uh, varies among species, but usually it's the time of emptying its crop. Um, for cetaceans, usually two hours uh, it's enough. So I, I, I don't tell the owners to fast the bird. Uh, usually two hours is the period so they can get to the clinic and we'll do all the exams and we'll prepare our OR, our OT. So uh, I usually do not take um, special care to fasting, except when the bird is, is already an in, in intern at the facilities. So I actually two to four hours of fasting is, is enough. I'll come back to this a little bit later. Uh, this is a special facility for marine birds. Uh, this frigate bird is a very large bird, so we cannot put it inside the avian treatment unit. So we got a huge one. This is a climatized container. We have air conditioning here, and we control the temperature inside all this, this room. And usually the birds are inside the cages, but this time they are resting on the net. Uh, we have to have special equip with equipment for do this feeding support, especially with pesitacins, you know, parakeets, macaws. Because of their strong beak, we have to have big openers and uh, garbage feeding tubes, metal garbage fe feeding tubes. So the birds uh, do not break the tube while you are feeding it. Uh, for the respiratory system, uh, we should always have a oxygen supply. We can use 100% uh, oxygen, but it's very useful to have an, an oxygen concentrator. 
These equipments get the air from the environment and concentrate the oxygen and delivers uh, around uh, an air mix of 80% pure oxygen. So it's very good for uh, provide O2 to these birds for high, uh, very long periods. And, and it becomes cheap as you use them a lot even cheaper to fulfill this uh, pure oxygen and so it's a very handy equipment um, um, we'll need some equipment to deliver this oxygen to the bird so we usually use the gas anesthesia um, connections to deliver this oxygen but as i said we can do uh, it in special tents or that avian treatment unit but you can also improvise uh, you need to have masks for uh, anesthesia induction or even for o2 supply we need to have tracheal tubes um, i couldn't find one picture of the tube without this balloon without this cuff we do not use uh, tracheal tubes tracheal tubes with the cuffs. Birds have um, um, full cartilage trachea, um, different than mammals. They do not tolerate um, the, the balloon because the balloon may crack the trachea. We should always have uh, at our side a um, manual ventilator. Uh, if the birds has apnea, we should provide ventilation, mechanical ventilation. Uh, we can. Uh, it's very useful to have a mechanical ventilator. This is a small animal ventilator for open flow systems. Actually, this model is a quite old one, but it's very, very useful and um, here in brazil we 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 cannot find um very small tracheal tubes uh, even for veterinary patients we we have very uh, difficult to import equipment so many times we have to improvise so even for small pastorines we can adapt urethral tubes as tracheal tubes using this low dead space adapter. And we can provide a mechanical ventilation and also um, ventilatory uh, monitoring uh, very well. This is a picture of the bird's trachea. It's way easier to tube the bird than to tube a mammal. Uh, they don't have the epiglottis uh, at the trachea entrance. Uh, just behind the tongue is the is the is the trachea. So we also have to be very careful while doing force feeding to not um, feed inside the trachea because it's really easy to tube the trachea. Uh, and uh, good equipment to have to monitor res uh, respiration, respiratory function would be a pulse oximeter and capnography. I think capnography is the most use useful monitor for birds. Um, I'm speaking a little bit of anesthesia, but um, in avian medicine, uh, we are always walking with uh, close hands with anesthesia. For circulatory support, we have to do bleeding control and uh, external bleeding are relatively easy to find and to control. And internal bleeding are often um, very danger dangerous, and we basically don't have much time to to deal with internal bleeding. 
even during surgery, uh, while we are doing um, salomic surgery, if we uh, unfortunately uh, hit an artery, you don't even have time to get your hemostats and put it over there. It's the birds just uh, dies very quickly. Uh, but external bleeding we can control. If the bird is in shock, we should try to do a, a fluid load test and do this uh, emergency fluid therapy. I usually do these calculations, 20 ml per kilo in the bolus. Uh, it's very difficult to put an IV catheter in a small bird, so we usually use the intraosseous um, way. Okay, um, for uh, replacement fluid, we can use subcut um, fluids, and I always assume at least 5% of de dehydration when I do these replacement fluid calculations. Uh, one thing we should uh, take care is to always administer this fluid um, and with a warm fluid around 35 to 38 degrees Celsius. We can use the um, ONA as an intraosseous site or um, the tibial tarsus. And for to monitor the circulatory functions, we usually use the vascular Doppler. Uh, it's very handy. We can use um, ECG and non-invasive blood pressure as well, but it will be very difficult even to put the sensors in a very small bird. Uh, but the Doppler, we can use it. I don't think you will hear the Doppler, unfortunately, but it will be a sound like this. As you put the probe on the owner vein. So it's very useful to monitor it by the sound. Um, here, getting an intraosseous access. And on the left here is my working station at JCT, at the Utrelian. And I was really impressed of the quality of the equipment the first time I went over there. And this is my work, working station here in Sao Paulo. And so we work um, very similar. This is a Chilean eagle. Just to show you that the bird can be fully monitored with um, equipment similar to dogs and pets. If you have an equipment that can uh, monitor a cat or an animal up to three kilos, uh, this should uh, work for birds as well. Uh, this is an Amazon parrot and you see the difference between uh, um, breathing movements and ventilatory capacity. This bird was spontaneous breathing, and you can see at capnography, it's above 45. And it's, this is a um, respiratory acid, acidosis. As, and as we turn the mechanical ventilator on and do the positive pressure, the acidosis is controlled. So to use capnography for monitoring is very important. And if you don't have capnography, one thing that I uh, advise is to always do um, positive pressure. So always positive ventilate your bird. Um, one thing that 
makes a good surgery is to know what you are doing. So if you have a proper diagnosis, and for it, you, we need to do a complete physical exam, but we also need complementary exams. So we use hematology and biochemistry. We have um, a few different uh, things to look um, for liver functions, for uh, kidney functions than, than animals. We can use gasometry as well. Uh, we use a lot of x-ray, so to have an x-ray at your practice will make a lot of easier, make it a lot of easier. But we, keep, we can do ultrasound, CT scans, thermography is uh, one thing that we are doing each time more, uh, cytology and also endoscopy. So here um, are the two most common positions, the um, ventral dorsal positions and the lateral lateral positioning. And here we can see some foreign bodies, bodies at the proventricular area in the ventricular ventriculum area over here. Very easy to see. This is a um, radiograph evaluating this um, neoplasia here. Uh, this is an um, endoscopy for diagnostics. Uh, we usually do video surgery more for diagnosis than for treatment, except if it is um, foreign body removable. Uh, foreign body removals are uh, easily done with the flexible endoscopy, and I tend to use them uh, nowadays. I don't have the equipments, but I have a friend that comes to our clinic and do it for us. And we can get these foreign bodies even inside the ventriculum. If we have a bird that's over 300 grams, like an Amazon parrot or um, um, anything bigger than that, we can reach the proventriculum and the ventriculum. I wouldn't try to remove a um, foreign body and uh, in a cockatiel's ventriculum, for example, but in the crop, it, it works. And we can use ridge, ridge optics, ridge, uh, endoscopy with rigid optic, um, but they are mainly for uh, diagnosis. As Dr. D. V. Ash um, told at the uh, introduction, and this was the most common uh, surgical procedure in aviaries to check for reproductive disorders with a um, rigid uh, endoscope. Uh, you can remove um, aspergillomas with this technique, and you can remove um, tracheoparasites like the syngamos. Um, Mainly, these are the therapeutics indications for rigid endoscopy and flexible endoscopy. You have the application of removing um, foreign bodies. For tomography and CT scans, uh, I don't use them a lot, but I'm use them. I'm using them. Um, more and more every year, especially to plan uh, complex orthopedic cases like this um, osteodystrophies and that causes legs rotation. And now we are able to print the CT scans and plan our surgery in the in the models, and it has made my life way easier. Uh, Dr. Andre is a um, well-known figure. Uh, he has come with me uh, two times for the uterine and he has uh, changed his house to a 3D printer um, facility and we are learning to do this, these models. And 
just to end this general procedures, one thing that we must always take care for pseudocines uh, is with our surgical site, if they they can go with their beak and rupture our our sutures. So we have to think of an, an e-collar for the pseudocines. And we can adapt a lot of things, but we have commercially available uh, collar for birds. And the way that I think that is most comfortable for the bird is to using it upside down. So like this, with this Waroba. Uh, if you check the um, avian textbooks, you see the indication for these ball collars. They are made in Florida. I was able to use them, but I really don't think they are comfortable. Uh, especially for wild birds, they, they get really stressed using it. Uh, I, I really, I particularly don't like them. Uh, we can do this uh, neck bandages as well. But like I said, the um, way that I mostly like is doing it um, upside down with a transparent plastic device. We, these are the main um, drugs that I use um, in, in, the, in my surgical routine. Um, we have uh, this therapeutic um, formulary here from Carpenter that's very useful. It has a lot of uh, specific uh, species, specific doses. So I recommend to always have one of these at hand. Um, this clinical avian medicine from Harrison has a chapter uh, of, uh, with a huge formulary. Uh, it is also very useful. And uh, this book has uh, great chapters on soft tissue surgery, orthopedic surgery, and anesthetic, raptor biomedicine. Uh, this is a um, very uh, new book and it's very useful to follow all the surgical access. Um, I recommend this book as well. And if you have interest in Brazilian or South American animals, I should recommend um, our, our wildlife animal book, but it's written in Portuguese. So as you see, we can use um, a lot of drugs, but we will use mainly the same drugs as we use in small animal surgery. Um, going inside the surgery, some equipments that help me a lot is a very good light source. I like to use a headlamp. Uh, with a cold headlamp, uh, LED of a 3 watt or 5 watt lamp, uh, it helps a lot. Um, so I recommend you, we can have some dental Googles with um, this, this, this lamp uh, in a very cheap price. It helps a lot. Um, when we will choose our instruments for bird surgery, uh, we have to keep in mind that what's the size of the animal that we are going to operate. Um, mostly pet birds are small. Uh, a macaw is considered a large bird. It's a bird of around one kilo. And we can use um, similar instruments as dogs or cats. But if we are doing surgery on a cockatiel or a Australian budgerigar and a pastorine, birds that are less than 100 grams, we should uh, have in our hands uh, ophthalmic instruments like Castro Viejo needle holders, iris scissors, um, small hemostats, um, we can use blepharostats as retractors, 
And one thing that I always have in my hands are ammo clips. Uh, these ammo clips, they make our life very easy. Um, but um, sometimes we are surprised with very large birds. This is a common pelican that I had the pleasure to operate with Dr. Divi Ash and Dr. Nitesh at the Ahmedabad Wildlife Center this year. And was one of the biggest birds I've ever done surgery. It's a almost eight kilo bird with a huge wingspan and lots of muscle mass. So if you use the ophthalmic instruments in this bird, you your surgery will take much longer and we also have really really large birds so like i said i, I was speaking of cats and whales this is a male ostrich um, 150 kilos bird we that had a um, chronic uh, open wound at the elbow joint for almost one month that needed to, this wing needed to be amputated and this bird, uh, believe it or not, was a pet bird and the owner did not have a um, uh, truck to transport this bird so we had to do a field surgery but it's not because it's a field surgery that will not take special care of the monitoring so we can make sure that the surgery will go well. Uh, as we prepare our surgical site, we will have to do with the feathers. And this is something that um, mammal surger, surgeons are not used to. And many surgeons hate um, when have to do birds inside their OT because there will be feathers all around. And so the first thing that we may think that it's best to pluck all the feathers, but if you plan to release this bird, you should not pluck the primaries or the secondary feathers. And always remember that these feathers, they are attached to the preosteum and they tend to hurt a lot, they ache a lot when you pull them. So you have to do this under anesthesia and they will take many months to grow back. So if you plan to release this bird, do not pluck the primary or the secondary feathers. We usually only pluck the coverts. Um, there are other small feathers. This is a black kite prepared for a wing amputation. And one thing that you can do around the surgical site is to use um, paper tape to secure the feathers in place and make sure these feathers doesn't come in uh, your surgical site during surgery. So this is the operation field. Right here, uh, for an Amazon parrot. So you plug the coverts and paper tape uh, the surrounding feathers. This is a cockatiel with a feather cyst, one of the most common um, surgical problems that we'll face in pet bird medicine. The surrounding feathers um, secured with paper tape. And this is an um, ophthalmic drape with a um, transparent window and a um, transparent adhesive window. Uh, it's very useful to use this in birds. Uh, all the, you keep the anesthetist very happy because he can see the bird breathing. And this is, uh, uh, you have this full transparent drape from 3M, it's called Drape. Uh, I went to the U.S. three years ago and bought a lot of them. Unfortunately, I ran out of them and, and it's um, impractical to import more of them. So I'm using this one with a small window right now. 
it's a very 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 handy and for hemostasia uh, our sutures uh, i really recommend you to use monofilament absorbable sutures like polydioxone and polyglecaprone and you can use polyglycolic acid as vicryl as well but they are um, braided sutures multifilament sutures and even though it's a detail uh, the braided sutures has a um, sewing effect as it passes through the tissue it will uh, gently um, break the tissue and especially and if we are handling uh, very thin tendons uh, this can rupture the tendon as you pull the suture so i really recommend using monofilament absorbable sutures you can even use them um, at the skin so you don't have to remove them afterwards another thing that i always have at hand is a um, collagen sponge and this um, makes hemostasia way easier and uh, for mass removals uh, fatter cysts and uh, neoplasias they always have a um, vein or an artery way down at the bottom and as you take out all the, the the capsule of the pharisist you have a small bleeding and at the bottom if you put this collagen sponge uh, it will stop bleeding very easily and, and another thing that i always have at hand is um hemoclips uh, you can buy them from uh, human surgery, but they are usually very, very large pliers. Uh, I prefer to use the open surgery plier, like this one, than the endosurgery, because as I said, it's for human surgery. If you buy the endosurgery plier, it's an um, instrument of around 40 centimeters, so it's very hard to use it inside a bird, uh, even though this looks like a 16 centimeters needle holder uh, it has a special tip for each size of hemoclip and this is small and micro sizes here they are actually really 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 small so i use the small medium size and the medium large size you have to have a special plier for each size i use this both sizes here um, and i think it's it's enough the the large one it's really large you have a two centimeter two centimeter clip it's really really large i tend to use them in reptile surgery not in bird surgery bird surgery i use medium large but mostly of the time i use the small medium uh, size um, if you buy them directly from the manufacturer, they are actually cheap. One car cartridge, it's around one dollar. Uh, it's not expensive. The plier, uh, it costs around one hundred dollars. So uh, it's really delicate. If it fell on the floor, it will bend, and you will not be able to catch the clip anymore. So you have to have very special care with the plier but the clips are, are cheap uh, so this is the, the small medium size and it's a two millimeter clip so it's very 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 small and here is the using the clip to to remove the uterus And one thing that I particularly like, and I think it's uh, very important to have, is an electrosurgical unit. And I really uh, recommend using the bipolar forceps. Monopolar, 
you don't have control of which side of the bird is touching the pad and the feathers they isolate so you tend to overpower the unit um, so I'm, I'm a little bit scary of using monopolar surgery in birds but I tend to use bipolar as much as I can so uh, electro surgery is um, Cinnam is the same as radio surgery or electronic surgery. It gets the uh, electricity that comes out uh, from the um, uh, wall at 60 hertz and amplifies it to around uh, more than 200 kilohertz. And that's how it, uh, that's why it's called uh, radio surgery. You have basi basically three types of wave that you can configure your your, your your equipment. I tend to always use in the cutting mode because it does not provide a high voltage peak as the blend mode or the coagulation mode. Uh, this tend to cause overheating of the tissues. So I use it in the cutting mode uh, in a very low power. I have one that is was specifically designed for ophthalmic surgery. It only has this kind of mode, direct current, low power. So I use them a lot. And it's very useful to uh, handle uh, the tissues and dissecating tissues as it does coagulation at the same time. And if you have a little bit of more money to invest, I would recommend you to use the Ligasure. Uh, the Ligasure is an electrosurgery device that has a feedback mechanism. And as the tissues um, is coagulated, uh, its resistance changes and the equipment fills it. So it will deliver an, 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 a sound when the whole tissue is fully ready to be cut it and you will then action this trigger that will cut the tissue after it is fully coagulated and the, this equipment is FDA approved for up to six millimeter arteries so there will be no such big artery in any bird so you can use it to cut it almost everything there is only one clinic that i work that has one equipment like this and every time we have a special a special case that will require it the um, clinic's owner always does the surgery so um, i'm kind of always jealous about it this is a mass removal removal in an um, Amazon parrot. So it provides a very clean and dry cut. Uh, the use of self-retaining retractors are very useful in bird surgery, especially this retractor is called Lone Star Retractor. <clears throat> it makes our life very easy. Um, I had I, I left this picture even though it's an uh, orthopedic photo. Uh, I had this instrument um, special made at Ortomax and Gujarat. It's a uh, two inches bone forceps for birds. Very, very useful to have small instruments for birds. This is the bird that we were doing the surgery. Um, the use of blepharostat as a retractor, very useful and cheap. And for orthopedics, we usually use um, um, 
hand chuck to put the pins. We can use catheters as pins or as a lighter power drill. Um, here I'm going to show you a few cases. This is a removal of a feather cyst um, due to vitamins problem, nutritional problems, the growing feather cysts, and it contaminated. It does it creates an abscess over here, so we have to cut around it and clean all the wound. Um, usually, we find this caseous um, tissue. We have to remove it all. And like I said before, I usually put a um, collagen sponge inside the cyst to guarantee that we will have no hemorrhage as the birds return from the anesthesia and the blood pressure returns to normal. Here it's the uh, final aspect of the surgery. Um, removal of shantomas. Shantomas are um, common neoplasia of, uh, of birds. Uh, they are um, a mix of fat and connective tissue. Uh, and so they have this aspect of uh, fibros with uh, lipome um, tumors. They are very common also. Um, sometimes we face um, challenging surgeries, uh, removing these huge masses. This was an over 30-year-old Amazon parrot. Certainly this um, mass did not grow overnight, but you know, uh, They left it growing. So here I'm using the bipolar forceps to dissecate this mass and make sure there will be the less bleeding possible. In the if you think this bird loses five cc's of blood, it will <clears throat> uh, become shock. So this is the removal. This surgery was done last week. I still do not have the um, results from histopathology. And this is one thing that I tend not to do anymore, is to do simple interrupted sutures in the skin. Um, I do this for cytosines, because if they break the suture, it will not um, lose all the suture site. So for psittacines, I do the simple interrupter pattern. And here, as I had a lot of tension, I really needed, I really wanted to uh, um, to make sure that the tissue was in touch all the time during healing and it's healing very well. Um, surgeries of the crop. Uh, Ingluviotomy or ingluviography uh, are very common. Uh, a crop burn is a very common medical presentation in avian, uh, in pet medicine. So uh, people tend to overheat the food and feed them with, uh, and it burns the crop. So we have a burn wound here that Actually, we need to wait a few days to see how extensive this wound will go. If we do it immediately, uh, there's a chance that our surgery will necrose. So we have to wait like two days and we'll do uh, feeding support in the birds over these days. And as we see the full extension of the lesion, we can remove it. And we'll close the crop as we close any hollow um, organ. We use invaginating suture. I put this uh, scheme here, this drawing, because I'm, I call this Cushing suture. And I don't know uh, how do you call it. So 
uh, we use this we use this invagination suture uh, at the crop and then we close the skin over it um, we can do this in gluviotomy to remove uh, foreign bodies as well and another crop surgery Um, foreign body removals are very common in Asian medicine as well. This is a um, uh, removal of a um, for metal foreign body in a um, uh, guaruba. It's this yellow Amazon over here. And uh, I tend to use the um, endoscopy nowadays. I try to avoid to avoid uh, proventriculotomies or ventriculotomies because you have to open the coelom to you will rupture the air sacs this will make a very unstable anesthesia so I tend to recommend uh, endoscopy removable but we can do this as open surgery as well uh, you do a lateral access you open the proventriculum, uh, remove the foreign body, and we'll close it in an invaginated uh, suture pattern as the um, cushion uh, I showed in last case. So uh, this is why it got all these foreign bodies, a lot of toys inside the cage. This is a removal of foreign bodies in um, red macaw, scarlet macaw. Uh, they are large birds, so they tend to go very easily with the four millimeters flexible opticus. And for cockatiels, uh, I recommend only uh, endoscopy until the uh, to the um, to the crop level. Uh, some reproductive problems most common is egg binding, so an um, abnormal shape egg or um, nutritional defect will cause um, labor difficult, and we'll have to help the bird to deliver this egg. This Ecletus will, uh, had um, um, this egg adhered to the cloaca. We tried to crush it um, with um, doing aspiration with a needle and syringe. Usually you can aspirate the, the content the egg will crush and you pull it uh, through the, the cloaca uh, but here it just did not come out so we were really afraid of causing a hemorrhage because it was adhered to the cloaca so we opened it and manipulated with cotton buds and swabs sterile swabs and we could remove the, the shell uh, we always have to be extra careful when uh, doing surgery at the reproductive system of birds because it's very irrigated. Uh, it has a lot of small arteries, so we cannot afford an hemorrhage from, from these arteries. We should always clip them and electrical use electrical surgery to dissecate uh, any structure um, of the reproductive system and it's really really hard to remove the ovary because it's uh, really close connected with the kidney but fortunately uh, birds have a um, feedback um, endocrine mechanism if you remove all the salpinge and the uterus and um, the ovary will um, retract it will not evolve anymore 
and so you should not worry with all the follicles anymore if you remove uh, all the salpinge and the uterus. And I'm gonna finish with some um, muscle surgeries, especially wing surgeries, uh, propotation injuries. Uh, these are the main technique that I um, developed and learned with uh, my Indian friends. And I believe that any Indian vet surgeon that um, pretend to to operate a bird will face these cases, these kite string injury cases and uh, wing lacerations. So this is a typical uh, kite string lesion. And when I say propotation, I'm speaking about uh, the membranes that sustain flight and birds patagian is only made of the propotagium. Like bats, they have the uropotagium, dactylopotagium. Birds only have the propotagium. So if I say patagium or propotagium, they are actually the same for birds. And we should reconstruct all this membrane and especially take care of this tendon, the um, uh, propotagium tendon. We should reconnect it and reconstruct it before. So oh, this is how it is presented. Uh, we should make sure that both tips are connected and then we should cover them with the membrane. So I usually do simple sutures on the tendon. Uh, I, we cannot do that tenorephy that, are sh that is shown in the surgery, small animals textbooks, because <clears throat> we tend to pass the needle a lot inside the tendon and the tendon needs to break, uh, tends to break. So we do simple sutures and especially with monofilament absorbable sutures so we don't have that sewing effect, sewing effect uh, that the braided suture will, uh, will have. And after I, I do one stitch at the skin over um, the um, sutured tendon. So I make sure that the tendon suture is always co, um, uh, it's always, um, the skin is always over the, the suture of the tendon. And one thing that I learned in, in India and I've um, change it in my everyday surgery is to do a continuous suture at the bird's skin. Uh, I only change this for psittacines because they tend to break the suture with their beak. Um, but uh, it makes this the surgery way easier to suture the skin in a continuous pattern. Uh, I a little bit of, I have a little cautions. So I always do one or two uh, stops during this continuous uh, pattern at the, uh, at the skin. So here we can see that the tendon is reconstructed. Uh, we usually apply topic antibiotics over the skin. And especially at the wing, we do a bandage, a small bandage. So we, we can use gauze or uh, any type of drape. Uh, I really like to use this elastic um, bandage. Um, and this figure eight bandage wrap is a classic um, bird bandage. You will find it in every textbook, and we should uh, make sure to to get this 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 bandage. Uh, but we should not leave it for longer than uh, one week or ten days, because otherwise all the muscle will atrophy. 
This is a double wing lesion. Uh, sometimes it happens. And after three weeks, we should get it uh, all healed. And the bird will start the rehabilitation process um, to acquire physical condition to fly again. So, um, it's been one hour and a half of this presentation. I think uh, it's time to, to end. This was a um, brief presentation of the most common soft tissues surgeries that I do at my routine. Uh, hopefully, uh, this was um, good for all of you. Um, I, my intention was to give you a few tips to improve your results. I know many of you work in a, a mixed species practice, so um, sometimes you will be faced with this challenge of operating uh, a bird, and hopefully this uh, will shorten your your learning way to this this particular area of veterinary surgery uh, that for me is the one that I uh, really uh, like the most. If I could, I would operate birds all day, every day. Um, but sometimes I have to to deal with uh, other other species as well. Um, here uh, is my email and uh, all my Instagram accounts. You can make sure to contact me if you would like um, more information on literature or other cases. If you are, are interested in uh, bird rescue, especially, especially from remote areas, um, um, please visit um, the Leo, Lears McCall uh, Rescue Program page. Um, I have it uh, translated in English, and, and you can check it, all our, our updated news over there. And we are currently dealing with two rescued cases. And, but uh, we are constantly monitoring all over the year. This year, due to the COVID-19 pandemics, we suspended our activities over there. But if anyone is a bird watching fan, I should recommend that you come here visiting us to check the Leard Macau at their occurring site is one of the most beautiful things that you can experience in nature. And I would be very pleased to guide you your visit over there. And I'm speaking in the name of Dr. Andre here, uh, our friend that has come to India two times. And he also um, has um, and made uh, available um, a possible uh, a chance for you to come over here to do an um, a partnership and and uh, uh, to spend some time with us at his clinic and maybe we can do some surgery together. So I thank again uh, Dr. Diviash for the invitation and the India Society for Veterinary Surgery for this space. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll meet again soon. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I'll be here for any questions, if you have. Thank you, Dr. Pilani. A uh, few questions are there. Okay. Uh, because this avian surgery is not performed in uh, frequently in so many places, so what is the anesthesia protocol with injectable drugs in an, in birds? What we can go for the injectable anesthesia? What are the agents and what is the dose rate? Okay, 
Um, the main ag agents used for injectable uh, anesthesia uh, is the combination of ketamine and diazepam or midazolam. Um, these combinations goes very well. Uh, they have um, a quick induction time around five minutes and a relative quick uh, recovery time around 15 minutes that we should uh, take care um, to make sure that this bird will not fall or get stuck in anything while recovering. Uh, for the doses, um, I, I do not have a good memory, so I would recommend you to check for the doses, but comparing with um, dogs and cats, they are much higher doses. I would say around 20 uh, milligrams ketamine and uh, one milligram uh, midazolam uh, intramuscularly. We use just the chest muscle to inject it and it goes very well. Um, the only problem that you have is uh, to um, really observe the bird during recovery time so it will not get stuck anywhere and it will not be so agitated and um, but you can you can you can use this these combinations uh, for 30 minutes 45 minutes surgery um, very well also thank you sir and the next question is how we will deal with the nerves when we are operating the muscles? What precautions we have to take? Um, same precautions in uh, domestic animals. I tend not to uh, close the scissor. If I'm uh, dissecating uh, close to a nerve, I, um, I tend to go with the scissor um, close and open it, so I will um, separate the tissues, not cut the tissues near the nerves, but as you can see uh, in this picture here, we can uh, manipulate the nerve uh, with Um, uh, over here, uh, we can manipulate the nerve with caution, and um, and we will not have any problem with this. This is the radial nerve at the humeral aspect. I think this will be the most apparent nerve that we'll see uh, in in surgical approach. So this nerve we have to be very very careful, but. It, it's easy to, to surround it, it and, and not to cut it. Uh, so uh, I, I, don't, I don't tend to see them as a major issue because we can see this nerve very well and, and take care of it. Sir, whether, whether we are using the prosthetics in uh, birds? Um, the prosthetics uh, for like amputated birds. Um, we are trying to develop it to, to, to use it. Um, we have um, uh, the, the, this issue that the prosthetic will not be at the site for every time so we have to take care of the site eventually one time per week to change the bandage to see if there is not uh, uh, creating any wound uh, where the prosthetic is sitting and you have to have a um, collaborated bird so um, the bird must not try to take it off uh, all the time uh, I think this is the most, most difficult thing to, to find the patient. The patient that is uh, easy handling 
and will not try to take off the prosthetics. Um, but we are starting to do it, um, especially for uh, the feet, uh, to help the birds to perch easy. And I, I unfortunately do not have any pictures here, but we, we did it once with um yeah, with a bird that is um, like a like a and it is able to walk around, and, and uh, I think it was a su successful case. Let me see if I can get a photo here in another presentation. Uh, like here. Um, especially if um, the bird is amputated, um, lower the the hook uh, at at the tarsus metatarsus level. Uh, the few fewer joints you are involved, the easiest it is for the birds to um, get used with the prosthesis. So uh, these are the basically the main application of prosthesis. Um, there are a few people uh, doing big prosthesis, um, but I have I, I I don't have any cases uh, with big prosthesis, so I, I don't have much experience on it. Okay, does does that answer the, the question? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not listening. I think it's muted. Deepak, you are mute. Yes, sorry, sir. Sir, what precautions we have to uh, take while we are performing a long-standing surgery in avians? Um, you have to take caution with the bird temperature. So use a heating pad around the bird. If you do not have a, a heating pad, you can use um, warm water inside a glove or a plastic bottle. So you uh, make sure the bird do not lose temperature. You have to have special care with the um, respiratory monitoring because uh, things birds doesn't have a diaphragm. They uh, rely only on the um, um, coastal movement to breathe. And as surgery times increases, the muscle tends to relax it times more. And especially if you put the bird on ventral recumbency, the whole body weight will be over the external and will make it even, even more difficult for the bird to breathe. So the bird tend to accumulate uh, carbon dioxide at the air sacs. So uh, especially long anesthesias, you have to have especially uh, concerns with the respiratory ventilation. So I recommend to tube the bird and to um, positive ventilated so you make sure you have proper gas exchange uh, during all the the, the, the the surgical period sir what about fluid therapy in avians which fluid we will prefer and what are the conditions different conditions in which we can go for the fluid therapy let me put this back here um, so uh, I, I, as as we assume that the bird is dehydrated, uh, we should um, replace all this fluid. But uh, if the bird is uh, not alert, it uh, it's in a shock process. 
um, it's not breathing well, it does not have a proper blood pressure, uh, low heart rate, we may assume it is experience an um, acidosis metabolism. So if we use only normal saline, uh, we will be only um, replacing the fluids. We will we'll not have any um, benefits of anything that we put together inside these fluids. And the fluids tend to uh, go from the intravascular compartment to the tissue very quickly, if the, especially if the bird is dehydrated. So I tend to prefer to use a um, um, fingered lactated solution. So it has um, 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 more alkaline pH, so it will contrapound the uh, metabolism acidosis. So my first choice of fluid will be a hinger lactated uh, fluid. And if I have a colloid solution, like um, uh, endovenous collagen, uh, I, I, I can use it, it too in uh, this proportion of um, four to one. So if I'm planning to use 20 ml per kilo, uh, if I use a uh, colloid solution, I, I will use uh, 16 ml of crystalloid and 4 ml of colloid solution. So it's a very uh, small amount. And this tend to uh, make this emergency fluid stay a little bit longer inside the intravascular compartment. So we will make the blood pressure stay uh, high uh, a little longer. Um, so if I get a bird that I think is shocked, uh, we, uh, um, is in shock, I will do this emergency fluid uh, intraosseous uh, most of the time. Uh, if it's a large bird, I can try to get an um, intravenous site. And I will use uh, colloid or ringer lactated solution. Uh, I do not like to use saturated saline, you know, like um, N NaCl 20% uh, or 10% or concentrated because the birds tend to be dehydrated. And so if I put this much sodium in, inside the, 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 the vascular system, uh, I have a risk to, to do a... Um, Hypernatremia, so for uh, this kind of situations, these emergency situa situations, I do not use saturate, saturated saline. If it's during a surgery, uh, I am monitoring the bird, uh, we are facing a low pressure moment, I can use uh, saturated saline to uh, hide this pressure, but not on a... Um, shocked bird okay and so i use this this formula for emergency uh this bolus uh, uh, application and for replacement i will use this formula over here so if i get a um, one kilo bird i use 50 ml if it also has diarrhea i will put another 50 ml, so 100 ml, and at least 5%. So one kilo, 1,000 grams, 5% is another 50 ml um, to um, do this fluid replacement. Uh, this fluid therapy can be done uh, subcutaneously, and we can do it over uh, 24 to 48 hour period. So all this 150 ml of this example will be given uh, along this one to two days uh, period. But if I'm experience, uh, if I'm facing a uh, shock bird, I will do this uh, 20 ml per kilo in a seven minute bolus. Okay. Sir, uh, 
always make sure very important for birds to warm the fluid otherwise if you uh, inject this uh, in a, um, at a temperature uh, at the environment temperature you drop the birds temperature way way fast and and it's not good so next question is uh, do we perform the esophagotomy in addition to crop surgery in crop burns and how long we will have to keep the birds off fed post surgery um if you remove um uh, significant amount of tissue at at the uh, in crop surgeries is is that the question how long will i need to keep this bird um, um, in observation uh, i i would think um, over two days i think two days is a good um, time to observe the bird and since they have a um, high metabolic rate if you check their body weight uh, on a daily basis you should um, observe uh, a weight loss then you have to change your diet maybe increase uh, energy of this diet since the crop volume has lowered um, and you will need to uh, uh, enhance uh, to uh, feed the bird more fiercely and with a high energy uh, feeding formula. Uh, the easiest way to enhance the, um, the, the energy is to use um, um, chicken, chick birds formula for uh, um, uh, growing formulations uh, for chick birds and or, or you can add some kind of oil like palm oil uh, if it's a um, frugivorous bird and if it's um, 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 carnivorous bird you can use uh, fish oil to uh, uh, enhance this this uh, energy intake Sir, uh, what would be the prognosis or the success rate after performing major surgery in avians? Um, uh, this is a good question. And uh, since birds are very sensible animals, um, we have a lower success rate than domestic animal surgeries. So many surgeon, many surgeons um, try to do some bird surgeries, and the bird died. The bird dies on the table. They dies just after the surgery, and they get really frustrated about it, and um, uh, eventually stop doing this kind of surgery. So um, we usually have. Um, um, for soft tissue, I would say 90% success, success rate. It's a very um, good rate, but uh, it's lower than domestic animals. And for orthopedic surgeries, we usually have a 50 to 60% success. Um, so that is why I, uh, I spend a lot of time talking about uh, anesthesia and uh, all the supportive care equipments that we have to to have at our hands to to support our patients because uh, the surgery skills they are not very different especially if you are used to operate really small animals like um, kittens or toy breed uh, dogs um, if you have ophthalmic uh, skills, you will have skills to operate the bird. This will not be the difficult part. The difficult part will be the, um, um, the, the keeping, uh, the management, uh, the overall um, management skills that all the team will have. 
to support these uh, uh, nutritional requirements, the temperature requirements. Uh, these are, how can I say, even more difficult than the surgery itself. So um, uh, I really would like to encourage uh, the surgeon to do the, the surgery, but I uh, always would like to encourage this, the, the whole team, the whole um, uh, keeper's team um, to um, learn about uh, bird care and to uh, the, the private practice, the hospital, the clinics, the, 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 the university hospital to invest in this equipment so uh, you will uh, improve your, your results, the overall uh, care. It's very, very important uh, also as the surgical skills. Okay, sir. Thanks, sir, for uh, in this question answer session. India, the Indian Society for Veterinary Surgery is highly thankful to Dr. Pliano Montavani from Brazil for sparing valuable time from his busy schedule and deliver, to deliver this wonderful and informative webinar on avian soft tissue surgery. Uh, I think he has covered each and every aspect in a comprehensive manner and this presentation will certainly be helpful for the practitioners who are engaged particularly in the avian surgery and medicine. Uh, I am also thankful to Dr. Simrat Sagar Singh, President ISVS and Dr. D.P. Patil, Executive Secretary ISVS for constant support and motivation. My webinar team members, Dr. Nitin Bhatia from Intas Animal Health, Dr. Devesh, Zonal Secretary, West Zone, ISVS and Dr. Nilesh for their hard work, support and cooperation to make this webinar a success. I am also thankful to all the participants who spared their, their valuable time for attending this webinar and hopefully this webinar will give a new concepts in avian surgery and medicine to practitioners. Thank you to each and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. You have um, a great evening now. It was a pleasure for me and uh, hopefully we'll meet again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank <laughs> you.